and welcome to our fifth anniversary of the winter lecture series from the Great Sun Viaduct. Uh, again, this is our first lecture. We have uh, lectures coming up every Wednesday night in the month of February and March. Uh, so please join us uh, next week uh, again. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to read you a little bit about the Wheeling Intelligencer. Uh, West Virginia's oldest newspaper, older than the state itself, the Intelligencer has stood guard for 164 years against predatory interests which violate civil rights. That is the motto found on the masthead in each day's edition of the Intelligencer. And this serves as a constant reminder to John McCabe of the role and duty he has as the newspaper's managing editor, and of the legacy he carries forward for a newspaper that helped form the state of West Virginia. For more than 10 years, McCabe has helped lead the newsroom at Wheeling, which is tasked in providing area residents with the day's most complete and accurate news, sports, and features reporting. From public corruption to criminals to stories about dogs named Gangsta, that broke pause with Hollywood celebrities. Each day brings something new, and it is the, his responsibility to ensure that he makes news not only to be delivered to your doorstep each morning, but also to your personal devices as news happens. A Morgantown native and WVU Pearly Isaac Reed School of Journalism graduate, McCabe and his wife Kristen reside in Bethlehem with their three children. Please welcome John McCabe. Well, thank you, Paul. You may be booing me here in a little bit, given the national uh, trend toward the media these days, so keep that applause <laughs> at hand. And, and as we do go along, you know, I, I was not aware until, until today that I was kicking off the winter lecture series so that puts even a little bit bigger burden on me to, uh, to try to do a good job. And when I look down through the list of those coming after me, um, you know, I feel that, uh, feel that I, I probably don't deserve a place up here, but I am uh, happy for the invite and uh, hope that we can talk a little bit about you know, what you see scrolling on the screen here. Um, and, and I do apologize for the noise that you see in the, in the photos. They're not, uh, if you've seen the book, they're obviously not there. Uh, not there on the screen, it's just something between the two. But uh, you know, as we're going through this, you know, my first thought when, when Erica reached out to me was, what in the world am I going to talk about in a book of pictures? But it goes much deeper than that when I look at it, and I think you know, this book really does help to tell the tale of the Ohio Valley over the past half century, a uh, tale of ups and downs, and, and hopefully as we move forward, a, a tale of, uh, of rebound and, and opportunities. Um, Scott, do you want to pull that back? we're going through, if you have a question or you see a photo that you're curious about, one of our photographers uh, who is featured in the book, Scott McCloskey, is here with us tonight. Scott is a great public speaker, would love to get up here in front of you and talk about how he takes photos. And uh, <laughs> uh, But if you do have questions or you see something that catches your interest, Scott's there, he can, he can tab back to a picture, something we can talk about, uh, maybe an event. Um, you know, and, and I would like to talk about some of the photos, but, but first off, I do want to talk about, as, as Paul noted, I'm not from the Ohio Valley. I grew up in Morgantown. Uh, my first exposure to, to Wheeling in particular, but the Ohio Valley in general, was listening to my grandfather talk about he and my grandmother coming to Wheeling from Morgantown in the, you know, the 50s, in late 40s, early 50s, and, and maybe into the 60s, to shop at Stone's and maybe spend the weekend at the McClure and take part in what then was, you know, an extremely vibrant downtown. Uh, my first personal experience in Wheeling um, was when I was about 13. I went to a uh, 
I'm not sure my parents realized I was going to a Ray Stevens concert with a friend and, uh, and his older brother at the Capitol Theater. And if anyone who's listened to Ray Stevens, he can be a, not overly raunchy, but he's really not appropriate for 13. But, uh, you know, at that time, that was probably 83, 84, downtown Wheeling was a still a pretty happening place. And uh, Morgantown was very much, not the opposite, but different. Um, and so, you know, uh, met my lovely wife at WBU. We moved here. She's a, a, an area native. We moved up here, and I've been able to make a life here. Um, and I preface all that with, with this project that uh, was initiated by a local local gentleman sitting right over here, Perry Nardo. Mr. Nardo, could you stand up? Perry is our general manager at the Papers. Uh, I think I'm completely on correct a key native. And, uh, you know, we started talking, it's actually been about a year and a half, two years ago, about doing this book. And, you know, anyone who's put a book together, it's not something you do quickly. We had first started talking in probably 2015 about it. And it was a little bit later in the year, and we didn't really get around to it. We had a lot of other things going on. So early last year, just around this time, maybe in uh, March, February, March, I had uh, Andy Lloyd and uh, Art Lyman and Scott McCloskey to start gathering some of their photos. Art and Andy both are retired, and Scott is still working with us, and start gathering their photos from over their careers to see if we had something there that we could put a book together with, what you, know, what you typically think of as a coffee table book, but a, but a historical coffee table book, it really is. Um, so they, they got those photos together and uh, brought them into me, and they kind of sat around in a in a old dark room for another month or so until I finally realized that if we were going to do this project, we needed, I needed to get really moving on it. Um, so I brought them back in and they uh, asked them to give me about 200 photos apiece of what they considered to be their best work uh, from their, their careers, and you know, again in Andy Lloyd's case, 50 years at the newspapers. Um, and so we took those, we probably had maybe 650, 700 photos that we had to winnow down to. I think I counted once when we first finished up. It's close to 280, 300 photos that are featured throughout the book. And that wasn't an easy task. But what really, I think what really struck me during that task was, was what history we have here in this Ohio Valley. So many things have happened here. So many, you know, we've had presidential visits again. I mentioned Morgantown, and people look at Morgantown now and they see this small town that's growing. You know, when I was growing up in Morgantown, we didn't have presidents stop and make visits. We didn't have uh, the level of of things that took. You know, I can't remember Orville Redenbacher ever making a visit to Morgantown, and here he was out in Barnesville with Scott and he and his son getting a picture with uh, with Scott. Um, so many interesting people have come through here. So many interesting people have come out of this valley, and I think that's such a testament to, to the people who are here and who have been here. But there's just so much, this book for a non-Ohio Valley native gave me such a better appreciation for where I live. Did you have something, sir? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. So just a much better appreciation for where I live, the people who I now call my neighbors, my friends, and my family members, and what they, what they grew up with, uh, again, it's, it's funny, and I don't want to draw comparisons between Morgantown and, and we'll just say Wheeling in a broader sense, but you know, in Morgantown we had a river, we have the Monongahela River that flows through Morgantown. The level of importance of that river when you compare it to the Ohio is minuscule. You know, the river to me was a place as a kid I went to fish and you know, uh, catch carp and do all kind of nonsense. You know, up here the Ohio is a major thoroughfare for just a multitudes of products that pass through here, whether nowadays it's coal and natural gas pipe products that are going down the river. Um, you know, just it's such an engine for commerce. Um, so and again, seeing you know the photos that Scott has taken with folks who work on barges and, and how they live their life and what that life entails really gives me a much better understanding Particular, which is particularly good as a newspaper editor because you have to know the people that you're reporting on uh, as, to, as to what really makes this area tick. You know, one of the things that I'm sure everyone here thinks about as well as I do is, you know, 
over this 50 year span that we've highlighted in this book, this Ohio Valley has gone from, is, is just continued a gradual, what many would see as a decline. We've, you know, we're getting older, um, factories have left, commerce has left, but I think what really has me optimistic is, you know, we have a, a blank slate with which to write our future here right now. And it's gonna take things such as what's happening in, in Wheeling in some ways with a, a new way of thinking. Um, you know, it's going to take uh, bringing back some manufacturing. We can no longer just hope that service will, will provide us with what we need. You know, what's happened last week up at uh, the Sarah Junction, we used to be the Mingo Junction plan is a great thing for this area. Uh, what we you know, continue to see, the coal mines uh, being able to employ people, which is which is a definite positive for this area. Uh, natural gas will is coming back. Prices are up about forty, I think about forty three percent since over the last five months. Um, you know, does that mean that we all have higher gas bills? Yes, but it also means that people are going back to work because to reach that price point, people you know, the companies are going to drill. They've got the leases. They don't want to hold on to them any longer than they have to. Um, you know, and, and a lot of, right now, obviously, just to the south of us, a lot of optimism about the uh, Dilly, Dilly's Bond plant. Um, and I think those are great things. And, you know, that's, that's something later, if you would be interested in talking in some generalities about, about things in the Ohio Valley, I'd be happy to try to answer questions as best I can. Um, but you know, just the looking up here now, every every page, I think one of the really interesting things, every page tells its own story. Whether it be the girl eating a strawberry down at Jebbia's, um, or the, the young lady out at uh, Everett's Farm who was looking at a, into the blueberries in her eyes, and the blueberries were the same color. You know, those, you know I had a good discussion um, when the book first came out on, on a radio show that I take part in, and it was talking about just the the power of still photo compared to video. Right now, we hear it all the time in our industry, you know, video, video, video. But I dare say that I've never seen a video that can make me think and ponder a situation like a really good photo does. Anyone disagree with me on that? I mean, you can wonder what someone's, what's in their mind at that time? Where are they at today? What, you know, what were they thinking as you bite into a strawberry? or whatever it might be. Video is, you know, here and gone like that. And it's out of your mind, maybe even quicker. Um, and not that, you know, not that it's not important in, in things that we do, but, you know, just getting a photo. You know, taking a photo like that, that's, we ran it on Valentine's Day with the two swans coming together, and you see the shape of the heart. You know, that's something that, it takes a trained eye. You, know, you can sit there with a video camera all day and try to get that, and it's you're never going to get it just right. But someone like Scott or Andy Lloyd or Art, uh, Art Lyman, they knew what to do. They, that's what they spent their careers doing. And in turn, we get, I mean, this, this, Does anyone remember this, these series of photos we ran maybe, what, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, Scott? Anyone recall these at all? This was taken outside of St. Mike's? Or was it? St. Mike's Church. Yeah, St. Michael's Church in Wheeling. And a couple days, this was right before Mother's Day. Um, and uh, someone called into our newsroom and said, hey, there's this you know, bird that's uh, made its nest up in the, up in the, uh, Crown of the Blessed Mother, and it's just kind of, you think, oh, it's kind of a neat photo. Well, you know, not only did we get that, but we were able to come back two days later, maybe, and get the chicks hatched, right, you know, I think it was the day before Mother's Day. Yeah. How neat is that? You know, that, that, that just, it's a skill that, that, you know, is harder to find today, number one. And, um, and again, I just, I look at guys like this, and I like to take photos, but, you know, nowhere near the level of expertise or ingenuity that they employ with what they do. Um, so I think, th you know, photos like that, that's what makes our industry interesting. That's why we wanted to put this book together um, to really highlight 
number one, the great work that we do, but number two, life here in the Ohio Valley, that is just an interesting aspect of our lives that will forever be remembered through those photos. Long after any of us are around, someone can pick up this book or find it somewhere else and think, oh, you know, in 2008, look what they did. That's really a neat setting that, that happened. You know, here we have the, um, the 463rd when it came back from overseas and, and, uh, and other military you know, groups, men who have been gone for a year meeting with, with their families. Those are priceless moments that are, you know, here and gone in a blink of an eye. And uh, so to me, that's what really putting this book together made it such a treat to learn more of the Ohio Valley's history um, and a better understanding of the people, again, who I live with now. And, uh, it, and that's, that's a lot of fun. So, does anyone have any, has anyone seen the book before today? I ask that question. No, okay. Well, that's not a good thing. Hopefully, they are for sale if you'd like to buy one afterward, because I'm a poor shill. And that's <laughs> you know, so, um, the, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well, just for a second. I was telling Dan, um, telling someone earlier, you meet so many people, and remember who it was, maybe it was Paul. But, uh, one of the things when we started this project, the gentleman, uh, Bob Ritz was his name, with the company that printed this book, when he started talking to me about the promotional plan that we had, to, that we had, were going to put in place for this, he said, you know, uh, I told him, and he said, we really need to ramp that up about threefold. And I said, okay, and he said, made a good point, he said, you know, to get just about the time that people will notice what you're doing is the time that you think you're about three levels overboard with your promotion of a product today. And I think that's an interesting statement on us as a society that we don't ever really slow down anymore. We don't stop and look at what's in front of us. You know, we spent probably a solid uh, two and a half, three months promoting this book prior to Christmas. And it was only right about the end of that process as we neared into you know, October and into November that sales really started to pick up. I was very nervous for a long time because we were sitting on a lot of copies of books that I wasn't quite sure we were going to sell. Uh, but you know, as word starts to spread, it, uh, you know, people see what it is. So the, you know, the book itself, it's 128 pages. And again, as I said, it's 280, I think it was 280. But some of the photos, it just who here remembers when Wheeling Park was used for uh, for military uh, maneuvers on weekends? Anyone? We have a photo of it in there. I think it was a photo. Yeah, I never would have imagined that Wheeling Park was used for National Guard training. Um, you know, remembers when Tom Jones was here and Charlie Rich? Uh, you raised your hand, didn't you? <laughs> You know, you look back at some of the, everyone here's seen the movie Walk the Line, probably, you know, and you think of uh, Johnny Cash coming to Wheeling, and you know, you just look at some of the, the folks who came in. You, anyone remember Terry Bradshaw coming to the Capitol to sing? Who would have imagined? We had a series of, like a dozen photos of him at the Capitol, down serenading you know, a crowd of mainly kids in Steeler t-shirts. Um, but who would ever, you know, it'll be coming up, or we may have just passed it, but you know, um, you know Marie Osmond and, and um, you know, Olivia Newton-John. I mean, it's just amazing, Kenny Rogers, the names, again, as I said earlier, the names that have passed through this area and who have lived here and, and have made their mark here, it's, the, the history of the Ohio Valley is something that, that I hope all of you treasure obviously being part of a, a group such as this that, that you do, but it's it's really something to to be proud of. And I know I'm proud today to to call it part of my history as I raise my children here in excellent public schools. Um, and you know, we all work toward a common goal of making a better community for one another. How about fires? What's, what's a big fire anyone remembers? Barnhart's downtown Wheeling, maybe, or Imperial Display. You know, those photos are there. Those were, as Scott can attest on some of those, those were you know, unbelievable events that just had 
you know, made, you know, again, remade the landscape of downtown Wheeling. Um, so lost early. I think we just passed that a minute ago. The Capitol, and then, you know, obviously had a large group there for, I think it was a Charlie Rich concert. Anyone have any questions? Comments? Complaints? Yes, ma'am. Well, we decided, we looked at it and looked primarily at, at how each of our photographers, what the, the bulk of their, of their photographs were, either color, black and white. Um, so when we kind of sorted everything out, Art Lime and had a large collection of really good black and white photos, which, so when, you know, so this book is 32 pages, it's, it's half color, half black and white. The first 32 pages are black and white, the next 64 are color, and then the last 32 are black and white. So we decided to bookend our color that way, and Art's photos were, were excellent in black and white, much better than his color photos for whatever reason. So we put him up front and gave him some additional room in the back if you got through some title pages. And then Scott McCloskey, all of his photos were in color, so it made more sense to really kind of highlight him in the middle of, of our section there um, with you know, just wonderful color photos. And then in the back, we had Andy Lloyd, who had a really strong mix of color and black and white. You know, Andy had a real love for the Capitol Theater. And, um, and he would, uh, so he had, again, most of our shows in, in the Jamboree photos that we had. So we kind of gave Andy uh, eight pages of color, and, or maybe 16 pages of color, then the rest black and white. So it was really just a matter of looking at what we had. We could have done all color, we could have done all black and white, but I think when you cover that type of a range, uh, trying to mix it up really, I think, makes, you know, the black and, a really good black and white photo is, is in me, to me, in a lot of ways, better than a really good color photo. You just get more depth out of it. That answer your question, okay? No, it's not really No, 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 by no means. These are just from, you know, doing it that way would have been very lopsided because we, you know, we had, slew of photos from the 70s and the 80s, not as many from the 60s, you know, maybe more from the 90s. You know, so it really didn't make any sense to, die, to try to do it chronologically. It's as much, you know, I think Scott put it really well earlier when he was talking. It's probably more a book of Ohio Valley life than it is a book of news photos, if that makes sense. So a lot of news photos in it, but it's more a look at how we live our lives here in Ohio Valley, the things we do, the places we visit, our, our people. That's really what makes, I think, the book a very unique, uh, it, it just has a very unique presentation that way. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The uh, span of years, uh, apparently prior to 1960, was not included. Correct. Yeah, probably about 67, I think, is the oldest photo we have in here. And there's just a few from that time frame. Um, again, you get into the 70s, we really have a lot. Um, because it's just like anything, you know, uh, things get lost. Um, you know, I, I would have hoped we'd have had a few more photos from the 60s, but we just didn't. You know, Andy Lloyd was our only photographer who started. He started in 66 or 65. Art Lyman uh, was, I think as his bio points out in the book, was at Kent State University in, in the early 70s when they had the shooting there. Um, so he didn't start with us until... He was on campus. Yeah, he was actually on campus when the shooting happened uh, at Kent State. So Art wasn't until the early 70s, and then Scott came in in 80, 86. So he's about 30 years for Scott. Yes, sir? How has the digital photography age changed what... Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's probably. I mean, the biggest thing is you're no longer taking your film back to the dark room and processing everything. Um, you know, part of the problem I think we find today with digital photography is that everyone can have a camera, and about three percent of the people know how to use them correctly. I had a young lady today who's a reporter wondering why her photos were blurry while well, she's shooting inside. Uh, on an automatic setting with no flash, 
So unless you get that person to sit perfectly still and not flinch in any way, shape, or form, you're okay. You use your flash or even try to use your, your program feature as opposed to automatic, and you're going to get at least a better chance for that photo to come out well. Um, I think you know part of it is, and Scott can attest to this much better than I, but the art of taking a photograph is being lost. I mean, you still have professional photographers who know, but even you know, 20 years ago, if you were just fancying yourself an amateur photographer, all you had to know how to do, or you had to learn how to work your camera, you had to learn the settings. Uh, you know, nowadays, you, know, you take 5,000 photos of an event, you get 10 of them might come out good, you know, then if that's all you're looking for. Um, you know, I think it's impacted things such as wedding photography. I see a lot more people who probably shouldn't be wedding photographers who are in that line of business now, because they'll just take volumes of photos and give someone a CD or a DVD and let them pick out hopefully what they like. Um, so that, that's that been the biggest challenge. So, you know, there, there's the, the benefits again, it's, it's just so much more instantaneous. You can see right away if you have a good photo. Um, you know, before you take 35 pictures on a roll and you come back and the exposures were terrible, you were out of luck. So uh, that, that's probably the biggest change. Yes, sir. So does the newspaper keep an archive of the pictures, or is it each individual photography? Well, we had some. That, that's a really good question. You know, it, it's just like we have a lot of, like, back where we have our archives, I can go back and find a lot of publicity photos and a lot of older photos than this. Um, but primarily for probably, you know, in this age, or in this age, date range we're talking about, from the 60s to the 80s, probably maybe even up into the mid-90s, I would say, probably not a very good archive was kept. Uh, not as good as it should have been for our photographers. Now, they all kept their own, which thank goodness they did because that helped us out a lot. Um, and, you know, Scott has an entire archive pretty much of his work at, at, at our office. And, uh, you know, and as we talk about today, the big question today is what is the correct way to store things today? Photos, uh, PDFs, anything, you know, do you store them on a, on a cloud, on a flash drive, on an external drive? Do you keep them on a DVD? There's a lot of different ways to do it, but, you know, in 10 years, will we even say the words DVD anymore, except for some old movie that like a VHS tape was on or something, you know, or a... You know, so everything is changing so fast that makes we have these discussions, not frequently, but every so often, of what is the correct way to archive our newspapers, our photos, our stories, and there's really not, industry-wide, there's not a really good answer because, again, nobody really looks long-term like this anymore. I think, you know, newspapers are unique in that sense that we have a history, we, we keep our area's history. And you know, it allows us to do projects such as this one that uh, really bring out the best in, in who we are. Sometimes in the worst of situations, um, you know, Ouija Creek. I'm sure everyone here remembers that. Scott can remembers that vividly. You know, what I remember about it is, you know, not living here at the time. I remember reading a blip somewhere and not really having any idea where where Ouija Creek was even at. So you know, that's what's interesting. Everything is so local. Again, I was you know, 80 miles away at the time, and I had no idea where Ouija Creek was. You know, now, it's, I understand how you know, so much better how much of an important part of this area's history and identity that event has become. Yes, Paul. Uh, uh, who owns the copyrights to the photographs? The photographer or the newspaper? The newspaper does, yes. Yeah, anything that they would take, you know, the newspaper, if they would take it for as part of their job duties, the newspaper does hold the copyright. And as far as the storage now of digital material, how is it being stored? Is it being stored on uh, uh, CDs or DVDs or uh, disk drives? Or just about anything you can imagine. We have backups for backups for backups because there's just that uncertainty. You know, I keep things on, on a cloud drive. I have them on uh, external hard drives. We have, we keep you know, certain things on thumb drives. We have them on servers within our newsroom, um, on DVDs. So you, you know, that, and again, as I mentioned earlier, that's really the, the big challenge, I think, as we move forward with photography and so many other things is 
change of the, the pace of change with technology is moving so much faster than any of us are able to adapt to. So that when we you know, come up with a new solution today, we're already two years behind what technology or technology is at. So it's uh, it's very very challenging. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, this is a little bit off topic. I'm just curious. I just read the Post Gazette. There's rumors it might go to the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. It might go to five days a week. The Pittsburgh version of the Tribune. You went out of business November 30th. Are you folks own newspapers all up and down the river. You on the opportunity of mirroring you on the morning journal Lisbon. How is this business viable still for you folks? They want me to answer that one. I mean, I don't know. It's not like the Herald Star. It seems to get thinner and thinner and fewer. Yeah. The business is. I feel my no, go right ahead. The business is still very viable. We, 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 we find ways to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just like any other business. We're going to go through cycles. Uh, you mentioned that our page count is not what it used to be. Well, that's because businesses in the area are what they used to be. You know, we're very excited. I, mean, I was writing some forecast stuff just uh, this last couple of days, and for the first time in probably eight years, I've, I've felt that I can actually write that we have some hope for improvement in the Ohio Valley. I look at all the growth in downtown Wheeling with the health plan, investors uh, building uh, apartment buildings and so forth. John mentioned the steel mill in Mingo Junction. I drove down to Ormet, past Ormet two days last week and uh, they, they uh, left two plot lines standing plus the cast uh, building. So there's rumors that if the aluminum company, the aluminum prices come back, they may start back up. Naturally, the cracker plant. I think if all those things happen, you'll see uh, industries and businesses thrive, and then you'll see our, our pages grow. I mean, but no, we're still very viable. We, we're viable because we do a lot of things that allow us to be efficient. You know, we, we, print, we print all the papers from now, starting in January, from Steubenville to New Martinsville, all seven of those papers are printed in our, our facility that we built in 2002. The one on Wheeling we, we Creek? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear people? Yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, wow. we started doing that January 9th. So we're able to, we're able to you know, gain, as, just like any business, gain as many efficiencies mm -hmm. as we can. But then we're still very viable. Uh, we still believe, as John has said, we still believe we are the leading news provider in the Ohio Valley, and quite honestly, we provide more local coverage than anyone. So we just have to make sure we do a good job in educating our younger people the importance of reading, mm -hmm. the importance of not just going to a website that's going to tell you what you want to hear, but go to multiple news sources like our newspaper pages and read what you read about things and make your own decision and balance it out. So, you know, but we're, we're, we're still viable and uh, we'll be here for a while. Okay. And it is challenging in bigger markets, and that's what you're seeing a lot of this happen. Is the bigger metro markets that that uh, you know that you know Cleveland uh, has already done that. New Orleans years back went to uh, a couple days a week of, of printing and more, you know, online. So it is a it is a different time. Yes, Dan. Yep, you know, Perry. Uh, in terms of the actual newspapers themselves with these stories, how does the newspaper keep those? Do you keep Copies, do you have big, I, I've seen before where there were like big uh, uh, big binders that they would put the newspapers in. How do you actually? Sure, I can answer that. Yeah, 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 so we have, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we still do archive our, our papers. Uh, we get, we archive on uh, microfilm as well. The Ohio County Public Library has an entire copy of our, of the intel from August 24th, 1852 through today. Each month they get a new one, we get it in our office as well. Um, WBU uh, a few years back stepped forward and, and put up a good bit of money to start digitizing a lot of our older editions with the hopes of getting through the end of the 19th century uh, very soon. Uh, so that's, you know, you can go online right now and read papers, uh, you can read the Intelligencer during the time when the state was being formed and West Virginia was being formed. It's really neat because it's, you know, you go to the library, you got to scroll through the film. This is a full digitized version of those and I went down and watched them do it. You know, they have these hand scanners because these talk, you know, these papers are so old and frail and they go over them um, and to, to preserve them that way. So it, uh, you know, we also had, I think it was maybe about, well, maybe five or six years ago now, the library in Wheeling had, uh, you know, as you said, big, voluminous binders 
of the newspapers went all the way back into the 18, uh, 1850s in some cases. And they were going to throw them away because they were just sitting in storage. Oh, no, no, no. So now, with their, now they're sitting in our storage. But they're still neat. You know, a couple years back, I actually got it, you know, they worked out perfectly. Uh, I needed some front pages. You know, anyone ever want to staple and put a, something on like a cork board, not a cork, you know, like a, a poster board. I needed some front pages for a project I was working on. I was able to take those and, you know, you can take pictures. You essentially take four pictures of a, you know, how big those pages were. Take four pictures of it and then you kind of stitch them together to be where you can't tell. And it's an easy recreation of that front page. And so it's nice to have those in-house if we need something. Um, but no, we still do, you know, the, the papers themselves still do get preserved uh, for, for future generations. We can talk more about the book if you want, if, or if anyone has any questions about the book, or you know, what's going on nationally. Again, it's got about 15 minutes left, or however long you want. Um, yes, sir? Is it a uh, limited edition, the book, or is it unlimited edition? Well, once we sell what's on the table here, in about four more boxes, it will be a, an out-of-stock edition. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And I'll be the happiest man on the planet. <laughs> It's, uh, and I'm not kidding when I say it has been, it is a real challenge to get people, even folks such as ourselves, I'm as bad as anyone else, to stop and really look at what's right in front of them and catch, you know, really maybe get an understanding of what it is. I had a lot of people who called me and said, oh, I saw those ads, but I didn't know what it was. Well, it said right there what it was. Um, but, you know, people just kind of skim by. I read a, read a study a couple days ago that um, a journalist and professor studied how young people read an actual printed edition of the newspaper. They read it like they read their phones or their tablets. They skip around. They don't focus on anything. That scares the living daylights out of me because at a time when we have, this is an old phrase that I've used many times, but you know we live in an age where we have so much information available that I feel like people know so much less than they used to because they don't focus on any one thing or they're just looking for something to to affirm their notions that they already have. That's pretty scary. Any other questions? Thoughts? Concerns? Complaints? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Brian, yeah. There are pictures of the old imperial black, black house. We did not have any. That's, we talked about that. Didn't have any from Imperial, didn't have any from Fostoria down in Moundsville. I remember, you know. I remember when I was a kid, uh, my uncle, um, he worked for the demolition man, Aaron Blair, and he actually helped tear the Imperial down. And the stack, when I was a kid, I was uh, four or five years old, somewhere in there. I remember standing beside my uncle whenever he, whenever he blasted the stack, he was uh, the old imperial there for um, I, I remember when he went inside, he went in the bottom and he, he went up inside and set the dynamite in him and uh, he lifted out mm -hmm. the car. I watched, uh, watched, they used the crane, he got on the crane the stack and they brought him down and put him on the ground and after they took it all up I was standing there when he blasted the stack that's one thing I'll always remember the stack. Anybody here watch the burger plant stack fall? Yeah. It was a pretty neat thing wasn't it? It was you know it's amazing how that works nowadays they just drop that thing exactly where they wanted to and you know here we are what seven months later and would think that there was never a power plant at that site. How quickly they cleared that out. Right. Yeah, they did work on that. Quick. Yeah, they really did. It, uh, so let me ask you: What's is anyone here hearing about the cracker plant? Go. I would think that PTT would have to find some reason not to build it now with the amount of money they've invested. Um, that's, they've made a sizable investment to the set prices are coming back up. Uh, Shell's moving forward with its plan up in Manaka. And uh, you know, those, those type of things, I don't think any of us really understands unless you've seen one of these, these plants and, and what comes around it, how big and how, 
how much commerce that will generate for local people right away with construction jobs. Um, you know, I'm sure I've heard that PTT has already been to union halls or not, maybe the, the company that they're working with to build it um, in, up into Pennsylvania and down into Parkersburg and over toward Columbus because they, we just don't have the, the number of workers that are going to be needed to build that without help from outside. So this is, pull back on that one, this is an interesting photo. I think these next two pages were, were some of my more favorite photos in the paper. These two folks were from, they were from somewhere. <laughs> they were from Wheeling. Abe and Emily were their names. Art Lyman remembers these two vividly. And they were just, go back one or They were coming through town with in this painted up jalopy they were in. Who knows what in the world it was. And, uh, you know, but what a, you know, you look at their faces and, and you know, that's where you know, earlier I was talking about black and white photos. Go to the next one, Scott. You know, everyone here had a, a, a Baba, a Babushka, if you grew up Slavic at all. And, you know, how this woman was waiting in line for government cheese. Everyone remember government cheese? Yeah. That's my daughter over here. She knows what government cheese is. She's never going to, never, never heard of it. Huh. You know what government cheese is? No? You just read your book. Yeah. Um, so, but again, you know, you wonder as you look at their faces, you know, what were they thinking? What, what, was, what was their life like? That's, again, I think what still photography makes it so unique. Um, you know, how many of us as kids and adults look through National Geographic at some of the striking photos that they presented from around the world and, and that still to this day at least sit in my head? Um, yes, sir, you had a question? summer of 2002 when the steel from the World Trade Center rolled through the area. And uh, the woman who's in the photo um, here holding her granddaughter, she's got her hand on the steel, she called me one day and spent about 20 minutes on the phone with me thanking me so much for just helping her to remember what she felt on that day as, as that came through the area. She bought three or four copies of the book gave one to her granddaughter who of course has no memory of it whatsoever because she was about three or four at the time. But uh, again, that's what I think has really made this book fun is it has touched a lot of a lot of lives and a lot of people in the Ohio Valley, brought back a lot of good memories and sometimes some bad ones. We look back at floods and fires, but it's all part of you what know, makes us who we are. Resilient people who respect one another and, and try our best each day to, to provide a better life a better life for, for ourselves and, and those around us. Anyone have any questions about Donald Trump? <laughs> Anyone want to hear stand up? No? What's everyone think of Trump? What do you think of the president so far? <laughs> he is doing, he's doing what he said, I'll give him that, huh? Is he not? He's not backing down. Yes, ma'am. I don't mind being a deplorable. <laughs> you know what? Do you find, I was talking to someone who's definitely an anti-Trump person, but he's a good friend of mine. Um, I was talking to him a couple weeks ago, and, and he was telling me of some friends of his who actually are now looking, you know, it's a, a husband and wife, and they're looking at their, their friends and, you know, questioning now if they can continue to be friends with people who support Trump or, or even vice versa. I find it to be a very... Uh, very divisive time in our country in a lot of ways, and uh, I hope we all keep that in mind that you know, our politics can, differ, can disagree, but we still got to live together, you know. No, no. Yes, sir. I was a visit of Trump here last summer. Mm -hmm. 
Murray Energy and up St. Hey, right here he is. Does he have any kind of history of ever being in this valley? You know? you know, I don't know. Um, years back, I was still a reporter at the paper, there was a, a, a pretty big rumor that he was floating around on Wheeling, not to say floating around on Wheeling Island, he was on Wheeling Island uh, for a day or two looking at some property, or somebody representing him. It was down maybe more the old uh, skating rink sits now. Um, I don't think anything ever came of that, but there was a, it was a pretty, the guy I heard it from was usually a fairly, a fairly credible person. Um, but of course his information could have been wrong. But I don't know other than that, I'd say probably not. Yes, ma'am. How many other presidents have given back their money? Right. Well, you know, I don't know. I would assume probably not. And okay, this is not what I wanted to have. It's not what she did. It does. Yes, sir. Oh, you're talking, uh, it's where the big musky buckets at, maybe. Yeah, where, yeah. The, where the high school band is. Yeah, it's in, uh, it's not Clarington. Uh, Caldwell. Caldwell, there Caldwell, we go. Yeah, that's real nice. That's real nice. That really is a big ATV park there. That is uh, Ohio Power that owns that, yeah. Yeah, Ohio Power. That's what my uncle called He used to get there every weekend. Mm -hmm. nice to Scott, do you want to tell them a little bit about the bucket? Scott was actually there. This was, I think, on the we'll go back. That was the final day of production. Is that that, uh, I got that to be on that. Is that that same bucket? It's, it's, a, a, that's a, silver it's a silver spade. That was the last week it was in operation. And uh, me and one of my one of the staffers, uh, we got to go on the silver spade and document it before they actually took it apart the following week. And uh, I can remember the foreman telling me. You're on the largest working shovel in the entire world right now, yeah. which was really awesome. You know, it's just, it was yeah. one of those moments that was really neat for me. Where was that at? It was out by Caddis, out in the Caddis area. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. I work for the Jim Manning. What was that? I worked for the Jim Oh, did you? Which would you do for the on on the shovels? Well, it's, any interesting stories from it? Just entering, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you think about that. You know, we all grew up playing with Tonka, Tonka toys, and these big trucks. And you know, here are guys who work on these every day. These massive earth movers that are just, you know, taking out entire hillsides with a couple swipes of that shovel. Um, it, it's really interesting. And again, one of those things. And we look here, sports. Um, you know, Lou Holtz grew up right not far from this area. Bill Stewart right down the river. Uh, what's that? Yeah, exactly. Getting ready to play Ohio State. Um, you know, just uh, this area is so steeped in, in just just richness and history, and I think I'm just about done. So, anyone have any other questions? I wanted to keep this over right around seven. It's a minute till. So I'll take one more. Yes, ma'am. I did myself and uh, primarily my, I, I did most of the squad helped some with making sure we had the right things. Don't want you know I think with a, with a project like this, we didn't want to take away from the photos with anything. You know we want the photos to tell the story. All that is just to give people an idea of what's going on. You can you know. If you remember it, you can think in your head what's going on, or you can just kind of, you know, just come up with your own conclusions. Well, thank you very much, folks. I've really appreciated this tonight. I hope I didn't put any, I don't think I put anyone to sleep, so that's, that's a good sign.